God has moved in their heart to move down there and to be a part of the work in the Amazon uh, region. So I want to encourage you guys to, to just pray about that. But it, it ties right in with what we're going to be talking about today for the next few minutes. And that is why we do what we do. Well, we do what we do so that people may hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because there's a reality on the horizon, whether you know this or not, Jesus is coming back one day. He's coming back. The Bible, it doesn't really, uh, we, we can debate all day long how that process happens. Does Jesus come back, you know, at a certain period of time? Uh, does he come back, you know, after the tribulation or before the tribulation or during the middle or whatever? Or as Jim said it this morning, when you're raptured, the people that weigh differently get raptured up at different speeds. I said, I don't know, but when I get raptured, I hope it's not like, whoa, 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 trying to get me up, you know? I started thinking about that. That's the kind of friendship we have, right? And he looked at me when he said it, so I don't even know what to think about that. But, but the question is not if Jesus is coming back, it's when, but, but he is coming back. I don't know about you all, but when I was a kid, I played a game called hide and seek. Y'all all played it, I'm sure, right? And I was the baby of the family. And we're mistreated, okay? I just want to tell you that right now. If you're an older sibling, whatever. Anyway, but um, we're the little, we're, I, was, I was the littlest of the family. I was the youngest in the generation for about 12 years. All my cousins were older than me, and they were older than me, than me by a mile. And so when we play hide-and-go-seek, you know, cousins and siblings, they don't really care about your feelings, okay? They just don't. They really want you to lose, and they want you to hurt when you lose, right? That's just siblings, right, and, and cousins. Man, we did stuff to each other. It's like, man, I think that's illegal now, right? Right? You're riding your dirt bike, and they just like ram you, knock you off. You know, it's just, it's crazy out there. Well, we'd play hide and go seek, and because you're the littlest, you're not as good as everybody else at usually. Even though you're small, your processing's not quick enough. And I remember they would say, count to 20. And what do you do when you're older and you count to 20? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, that's what you do. When you're little, you can't count that fast. You're just learning to count. So you're like, one, two, three. And so they had great. When they're counting, you're just running, right? And pretty soon, you hide under a blanket with your legs hanging out. Like, you, don't, you do everything you can, but you, you're, it's nerve-wracking because you know they're coming. I'm going to tell you today something. Jesus is coming, ready or not. This is, whether you're ready or not does not dictate whether or not he's coming. That dictates how you will fare when he comes. But he is coming, ready or not. I think there's three types of people in the room right now. I think there's some people in this room that you are ready for Jesus to return. You have been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. You have, you've experienced a life-changing encounter with a holy God. And you're walking out a faithful life for the kingdom of God. And you're just like, man, Jesus, come. I'm ready to see you. There's the other, completely other side of that, or maybe you're in this room right now and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior. You're an unbeliever. You're not a Christian. And you're nowhere ready for Jesus to return. You're not sure if he is, but if he does, you're not ready. You have no relationship with him. You have no hope of eternity because you're not ready at all. And I think there's a lot of us in this room may fall in this third group. I mean, you're, you've accepted Christ. You're saved but you're not living out a faithful life for Christ. And you would say, you know, I'm, I'm ready in the way that I'm saved, but I'm not really sure I'm ready to face him just yet. Because I know I've got a lot of garbage in my life that needs to be cleaned up. I've got some things in my life that I need to be doing differently. I, I've got some things in my life I need to surrender to him if I'm really going to say I'm ready to see him. Even though I trust him and I trust in my salvation, I have to be honest, there's been times in my life where I'm not sure I'd want Jesus walking up right about then. You, you, you follow me, right? And I think that's the three groups in this room. The ultimate thing you need to be ready is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's number one. But we're called to more than just knowing him and having fire insurance. We're called to walk with him and grow in grace. That's what this whole theme of this book, 2 Peter, has been about, this letter. And today we're going to be wrapping it up with the whole chapter. Chapter 3, we're going to cover it in 18 minutes. Probably not, but it's going to be close. All right, y'all ready? Chapter 3, if you've got your Bibles, I'm going to read a few verses and we're going to talk about some truths about the second coming that will not only 
inform you, but will prepare you so that you can be ready when Jesus does come back. Some things you can look to to go, okay, I see that. That parallels with what I'm seeing in the world today. So that you can have some evidence that Jesus is the real deal. If you've got your Bibles, turn me to 2 Peter chapter 3. It says this in verse 1. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. Peter said, I'm just trying to remind you of some things that you already know. I've already told you these things. You've been taught these things. Paul's been teaching these things. I've been teaching these things. These are not new things. This is not new information. You ever feel like that with your kids? Right? I didn't know I wasn't supposed to slap my sister upside the head. This is not new information. Yes, you do. Right? Peter's saying, this is not new. I'm reminding you that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. He's saying... The, the prophets prophesied. Jesus told you about this. The apostles told you about this. Knowing this, that first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. And they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked the fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of the water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of the, these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But the same, by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. There is so much to unpack here, but we're going to take a very over 30,000 foot view of this text today. The first thing I want you to understand about the last days, he said there are going to be scoffers who are present in your midst. A scoffer is someone who, the definition is someone who derides, someone who mocks. Uh, those beliefs that you may have. He says, in the last days, I want you to know something. There's going to be people around you in your culture, and they're not all going to be fan favorites of, or, or fans of Jesus Christ. They're not all going to be fans of this idea called Christianity. As a matter of fact, there will be many people around you who will scoff and mock at you about Jesus coming back. And they'll say stuff like this. Look at how everything's always been. And they'll just assume because of what they've experienced up to now that life's just going to keep on ticking away like it always has. They're going to use the things that they can observe and the things they have observed, and they're going to impose their beliefs about the future simply by what they've seen in the past. I want to tell you something. There's not a more scoffing field in our world than the world of science. Well, the science says that I must observe it, it must be repeatable, and I must be able to predict the outcome if I'm going to believe something. The problem is, is that's not a fair way to gauge supernatural things. This world did not come into being by natural events, therefore natural explanations will never do justice to the creative work of God. Just because you can look back and say these are how things have been going does not mean you can predict what will be. He says, as a matter of fact, let me explain it to you this way. He says, scoffers will say that he's not coming back because, look, everything points to the fact that God's not involved in this world. That's what they're going to say. He said, I want you to understand something about God. He said, the world and everything that you see and know was created by the very word of God to begin with. In verse 4, he says, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact. The heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water through water by the word of God. And that by, the, by, by, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. So, so not only was the world created by the word of God and the, the, the heavens, he said, the flood back in Genesis was God's word pronouncing judgment. So God's word created and God's word destroyed. He said, and by the very same word in verse 7, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, 
being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. In other words, he goes, the scoffers may tell you one thing, but I want you to know that the second coming and the end of the world is foreordained. It's going to happen, and the way you know it's going to happen is because God has said it's going to happen. It's his word that has the final say, not the scoffers. It's his word that has the final authority, not the discipline that argues against it, whether that be science or philosophy or history or whatever. He said it is the word of God that these things hang upon. And then he goes on and he says in verse 8 and 9, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with a Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow in fulfilling his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come reach repentance. Now, we don't have time to unpack this verse completely, but what I want to tell you in the context of what Peter's trying to say, he's saying, look, the reason that people are going to scoff is they're going to look back at history and go, Man, if God's coming, it doesn't seem obvious. Look how much time has passed. He said, I want you to understand something about the timetable of God. It does not look like the timetable of man. As a matter of fact, when we look at a thousand years, God's like, that's like a day. And here's the thing. He's not actually saying a thousand years is a literal day. He's trying to give you a literary device to say God does not measure time the way you do. See, God stands outside of time, and we stand inside of time. And it doesn't matter how long something seems to us, time has no true effect on the holy, omnipotent God. And so when, when you think something's taken a long time, and you're like, man, a thousand years have passed, two thousand years have passed, he says, don't let that rattle you, because God's not subject to time like you are. God's timetable is not like yours. I don't know about you, but as I get a little older, time starts looking different. Amen? With Bobby, we were talking this morning, right? And Bobby, I just, I don't know what, I don't remember what I said, but he said, well, when you get old, it's going to change. It's like, thank you for that encouraging word, Brother Bobby, right? I was feeling pretty good. Then I realized it's just downhill from here, right? No, I'll joke it aside, right, though? How many of y'all uh, who are older than 60 would raise your hand and say, life is shorter than you can imagine. Right? There's something about when you start piling up more years behind you, that time takes a different perspective. When you're 10, 11 years old, some of y'all in this room are, are kids, right? And you think, man, I don't know if I want to do that. That would take a year to do that. I'm going to tell you something. If it's worthwhile... A year is like that. Man, a year when I was 10 is like 10 years now, right? I don't, I don't know. if you, Time is a funny thing. And what the passage is saying is, look, imagine that's how time looks to me and you. Imagine to a holy God who stands outside of time altogether. We get so wrapped up on time. We get so wrapped up on, on the urgency of now, and, and we want things to be developed now. We want God to do something right now. We want God to act today. Man, I, I, I'm lonely, and I, I want a marriage. And this is kind of a side note, but, but man, I, I want to get married. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm already 19. I'm past my prime, right? And you're like, well, no. Um, but... God does not operate on the timetable that we do. And when it comes to the coming of, uh, of, of Jesus, as time passes on, we can easily fall into the trap of believing falsely that maybe God's not coming back because it's taken so long. Maybe he's not coming back because this world just keeps getting worse. Or maybe he's not coming back because, because things aren't, aren't working like I think they will. But I want you to hear something here from this verse. If you look back at, at verse 9, he says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness. In other words, it's not because God is not aware of time. He's, he's not slow like you're thinking. The reason that time continues on is that God is giving an opportunity for his creation to repent. God is gracious and God is loving. And there is a time that God is allowing. And don't think for a minute that God has forgotten about this world or forgotten about bringing Jesus back to the earth. It's simply that he is giving time, not willing that any should perish 
but that all should reach repentance. It's just like when your kid thinks they're getting away with something, and you know it, right? And they're like, man, I'm, I'm sneaky. My parents are dumb. No, we're not. We're gracious. There's a huge difference between being ignorant and being gracious. God is a gracious God. Can I, can I be honest with you right now? Some of us in this room have had near-death experiences in our lives, and God spared us because he's giving us time to turn our lives to him. You see, every second we live is a blessing from a holy God. You see, here's the thing. If the wages of sin is death, then anything I get beyond death as a sinner is grace from the hand of a holy God. The, the reason, and I, I know this sounds horrible to y'all, I want you to follow me. The reason that I wasn't zapped immediately in my sinfulness when I was brought into this world is not because I'm a pretty good guy. It's because God is a gracious God. And he gives me time to hear the gospel and respond to it. Some of us in this room are living on borrowed time. We're, we're taking advantage of the time God is giving us, thinking we will always have tomorrow. But all you have to do is read the newspaper and you will see it doesn't always mean that Jesus is coming back when you're going to meet, G when you're going to meet him for the first time. Some of you and some of us in this room may not be here tomorrow. So we have to look like every day could be the last because we're not owed the next day. We're not owed the next hour. We're not owed the next minute. Everyone in this room is blessed by God. And the reason I know that is because you have breath in your lungs right now. He doesn't owe us that. He's on a different timetable. What is God waiting for you to do? What is it that God is calling you out of? What is God calling you into? Some of us are living on borrowed time. And we think we always will have this time. Let me tell you, if you're over 60, you will realize this, right? We all know people who thought they were going to be here tomorrow, and they were not. Heard just this week from a friend of mine, co-worker. Her son lost a really good friend, 18 years old. He wasn't sick. He wasn't unhealthy. Nobody saw this coming. It was an accident. Here one moment, go on the next. What happened? His time was up. And I'm not trying to capitalize on that. I'm trying to bring a reality to the fact that we don't know how much time we have. We must redeem the time that we have. But God is on a different timetable. Not everybody gets the same amount of time. Some of us will live long lives on a world standard. Some of us will live shorter lives. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. What we are guaranteed is there will be a day of reckoning between us and a holy God. But God's on a different timetable. And he says, don't think that God is just ignoring this. God is being gracious and giving time. And then he says this, but the day of the Lord will come. How's it going to come? Like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. I don't know about y'all, but that doesn't sound like a pleasant day if you're on the wrong side of this. Like, right, I mean, you don't have to be a scholar to go, I hope I'm on his good side that day. I'm not trying to be trite, but let's just be honest. He says, the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away, and roar, and the heavenly bodies will have burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. He's saying, look, there is a day coming, and every chance you had is gone. And at that day, there are no chances. There's just a day of reckoning at that point. And what will determine your future has been decided before that day gets here. He says, and here's what that day is going to come like. It comes like a thief. When Jesus comes, it's not going to be that we get a warning shot an hour ahead of time so we can all go pray and repent. 
Matter of fact, another part of Scripture in Matthew 24, he says this, For as in, days, as in the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware that until the flood came and swept them all away, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. I used to read this passage as a younger man and a kid, and I used to think, man, and I heard preachers say this, like, it's like the days of Noah, it's just going to be so evil. And I, I think there, there's, there's a truth to that, but that's not really what I think the passage is teaching. The passage is not teaching about the evil of the day. The passage is teaching about the suddenness of judgment. And the unexpected nature of it. Noah is building an ark for 120 years. How slow do you have to be? He's building for 120 years. He's, he's called a preacher of righteousness in the Scriptures. We can kind of assume that when people saw this gigantic boat being built, that Noah probably told them why. We're not, we're not told exactly what he said, but I know human nature enough to know that a guy can't build a football-long boat and not create some questions. And he's a preacher of righteousness, and the idea is that very likely Noah preached and taught and called those people to repent because judgment was coming. And he says, it's going to be like that when Jesus comes back. He says, as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving a marriage. In other words, they were just living life like there was no judgment coming. He says, that's how the people were living. There's a boat out there being built for a flood that's coming, and the people are living like there's nothing to it. He said, and all the way up till the time the flood came and swept them all away. Can you imagine what they thought when the first raindrops started hitting their head. Can you imagine what they thought when they saw the first river overflowing? Can you imagine the regret? Can you imagine the, the fear? Can you imagine the ominous feeling because the door had been shut on the ark and there was no hope then? He says, it's going to be like that when Jesus returns. And it's going to be like a thief, boom, in the night. So many people are going to be caught off guard. They're going to, they're going to be surprised. They're going, to be, they're going to be taken aback. They're not even going to understand what's happening probably at first because it's going to happen so suddenly. It's going to be a worldwide event that's going to involve all of humanity, but it's going to have very personal consequences for everyone involved. I want you to hear that. And this is not a feel-good message, amen? It's not. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you should amen. If you are not, you should oh man. I just came up with that one, Brian. I'm not going to lie. Hang on. I'll write that one down. When I go talk to preachers, I'm going to say, you know what I said? No, I'm just joking. I'm not writing that down. You're like, it's not that good. Here's what I'm saying, though. He comes like a thief. It's going to be unexpected. You don't have time once it happens. Just like the ark, they didn't have time once it happened too late. So he said, here's what you need to do because of it. Here's the thing. If, if these things are accurate, and they are, then he spends the rest of the chapter, starting in verse 11, telling them how they should live because of it. He says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hasting the coming of the day of the God, because of that which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will, be melt, will melt as they burn, but according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found of him or by him without spot or blemish at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved pa uh, brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. And as he does in all of his letters when he speaks in them of these matters, there are some things in which that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you're not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So much here. But there's basically about six things that he says to do. He says, live lives of holiness and godliness because you never know when the day is going to be here. You don't want to be caught off guard living a life of selfishness. 
You want to be caught living a life of holiness and godliness. He says, wait and hasten the day. He says, anticipate, look forward to. It should be an energetic excitement for believers. And if you're, and I'm not saying I get, when I was a kid, man, I was just like, God, I really want you to come back, but can you wait till I get a woman? Because I'd really like to know what that's like, right? I'd really like to have a family, and I get all that. But what I'm saying is, on a spiritual note, there should be a desire that we have because we know we are ready to meet him, that we don't dread the day, but we look forward to the day we meet him. He says, hasten the day. Wait for the day. He says, be found without spot or blemish. He says, and with peace, count the patience of the Lord as salvation. Don't be taken away by error. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus, or Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He's saying, because of the truth and the reality of the coming of Christ, it should affect the way you live your life today. If the, if the coming of Jesus and the, and the reality that he's coming back does not affect your life, I would submit that you probably don't have a true grasp on the gravity of that event. There is a day that we will all stand before God. Every one of us. And it will be a grave day of reckoning for some. And it will be a day of celebration for others. And there will be no in-between. So as the musicians come up, I want to ask you a question. Are you going to be celebrating that day? Or dreadful that day? This is not a really hard sermon to preach. It's, it's very easy. It's simple. It's right here. The, the, it's, it's really not even that hard. I don't have to really be a scholar to read through this. All I have to do is say, do I believe that's true? And here's the thing. If it is true, and I believe it is, it doesn't even matter if you do believe it's true or not. It's just the way it is. So, so if this is accurate, and if this is going to be what happens, and I truly believe it is, then I really just have a decision to make. Am I going to live for king jesus so that when he returns i am ready to meet him or am i going to live for myself that's the only decision you have to make today now what that decision looks like might look different for different people if you're here and you've never accepted christ as your lord and savior and ask him to forgive you of your sins to save you and to trust him by faith in the work that jesus did when he died on the cross of calvary if you've never done that step that's your first step to be ready. That's it. That's step number one. That, that's it. That's step number one. That, that, there's no other step to take. That's the first one. And if you're in here and you've taken that step, but you have to be honest and say, but Chris, man, I would be embarrassed if God came right now. Man, I would be embarrassed of the life I've lived. I, man, I, I was saved. And I was redeemed, I have no doubt. But man, I'm, I'm embarrassed of the life that I'm living. Then the only decision you've got to make is to repent of that and to follow Him more. It's really not complicated. It's just hard because you have to give up the right to yourself and decide to live for Him. It's not complicated, it's just hard to do. So as we sing the song in this invitation, what I'm going to encourage you to do, what I'm going to challenge you to do, if you've never made the decision to follow Christ, that you would come down to this altar, let's pray, make that decision today. And if you have made that decision, but you're like, there's stuff in my life I need to repent of, then I want to challenge you, come to this altar and repent. You can repent where you are, you can. And I'm okay with that. But if the only thing that keeps you from coming and, and praying up here is embarrassment, let me assure you, everybody in this room has something to be embarrassed of. So don't let that fear hold you back from being obedient. What is it that God is calling you to do today? Are you ready? I mean, are you really ready? Because ready or not, 
He's coming back. And my job as a pastor is not to make the decision for you. It's to tell you this. He is coming back. Are you ready? Well, Chris, I don't think I should be saved just because I fear him. I think that's an okay place to start. I think it involves more than that. But I think we should have a realization and a real respect and a real fear of what our lives under the hand of a holy, omnipotent God can do to those who walk in disobedience to Him. I think we should fear. I think there should be a realization that we don't have heaven for the real people, saints, and then a lesser version for everyone else. That's not the gospel. I'm I'm telling you, I hear it preached, I hear it implied, Guys, if you don't have Jesus, you don't have hope. You've got to know that. I beg you, do not leave this room without knowing that Jesus is your hope for eternity. Do not leave this room. Let's stand. We're going to worship together, but we're going to take some time here to just do business with God. If you want to come up here and pray, I encourage you to do that today because there is a day where we're given account to a holy God. What will we say? Let's sing.